Welcome to Occult of Personality, Esoteric Podcast Extraordinaire. I'm your host, Greg Kaminsky. In episode number 210, we're joined again by our good friend, author and speaker, Angel Millar, to discuss his recent book, The Three Stages of Initiatic Spirituality, Craftsman, Warrior, Magician. A Cult of Personality podcast is made possible by you, the listeners, and by the subscribers to chamberofreflection.com, our membership site who aids us in the cause of informed, authentic, and accessible interviews about Western esotericism. Thank you again. Because of your support, we're able to bring you recordings of this caliber and many more to come. Anathema Publishing Limited. Quality occult books and contemporary esoterica. Established in 2011, Anathema Publishing aims to provide superior literature in content and form by creating a trinosophic relationship in troth and gabo between publisher, author, and reader. Anathema Publishing produces refined books for the true bibliophile on topics ranging from Gnosticism, traditional craft, alchemy, hermeticism, witchcraft, to Luciferian theosophy. www.anathemapublishing.com Now, in episode number 210, Angel Millar returns to the show to talk about his wonderful book, The Three Stages of Initiatic Spirituality, Craftsman, Warrior, Magician. You can find Angel online at angelmillar.com. I want to take a moment to express how grateful I am to Angel for his work, his friendship, and for the way that he values what makes us better, both individually and collectively. I have known Angel for almost as long as I've been doing this podcast, which is more than 15 years now. During that time, he has helped me, given me guidance, and shown me how to be more capable. I know that he has done and continues to do the same for others. I really enjoyed and learned from Angel's book, and I think no matter where you are on your path, it would be beneficial, and I highly recommend it, as I do all his work. I'm truly impressed with the writing and the clarity with which he expresses what are ultimately timeless ideas, but he makes them applicable to modern readers. The Three Stages of Initiatic Spirituality is not only a wonderful read, but it can help you begin to shift your perceptions and experience using what is taught along with the meditative exercises. The intro music is Awakening by Paul Avgerinos, and the outro music is Way of the Warrior by Seismic Anomaly. Angel Millar, welcome back to the podcast. It's always great to speak with you, and uh, today is no different. Thank you, Greg. It's good to be speaking with you again. It's always a pleasure. So I wanted to record this interview many months ago at this point, so I appreciate your patience and bearing with me through a variety of life's vicissitudes and ups and downs here, but um, I'm really happy to finally be speaking with you about your book, The Three Stages of Initiatic Spirituality, Craftsman, Warrior, Magician, published by Inner Traditions, and it's really a beautiful book, very well written, obviously, and well put together. Uh, I like the the cover design. I mean, I know we're not on video here. So I, I'm holding it up anyway, but this cover is really cool. And um, I think they did a great job with like putting the book together, like the yeah, composition yeah. of it. Yeah, I didn't design the cover, but a, a lot of people have commented that the covers are really cool. So yeah, they did a great job. Yeah, it's when I see it, it kind of like jumps off the shelf at me. Like it's yeah. a very cool design. Um, 
And I feel like it's worthy of the book that it's in clothing. Right. So maybe you could uh, start. I think people, most people listening know who you are and have heard you before on our podcast here, but yeah, maybe you could talk a little bit about why you wrote the book, um, what you were hoping to achieve. Sure. Sure. It. Yeah. Well, I suppose there are really uh, at least a couple of different reasons why I wrote it. And one being uh, personal and one being uh, the logical conclusion of uh, my uh, researches over the, over the last few years and to tackle the, um, the second one first. Um, I noticed uh, over a, a long period, um, uh, these three archetypes, the craftsman, warrior, and magician, uh, coming up in all kinds of different areas. Um, and it should be said that the uh, 20th century philologist, uh, George uh, Dumazil, um, claimed that ancient Indo-European um, uh, peoples uh, were uh, structured in terms of their society along the three castes of the warrior, uh, craftsman, or herder, and uh, the uh, priest or Brahman, and so, and so effectively uh, structured along the lines of the craftsman, warrior, magician. And, uh, and then th quite a long time ago, I, I read um, um, uh, Masonic Temples by uh, a former director of the Chancellor Robert R. Livingston Library of the Grand Lodge of New York. Um, he wasn't actually a Freemason, the author, but he was uh, a former director of the Masonic Library and Museum. And he wrote a book called Masonic Temples. And in there, he makes the claim that uh, uh, the, obviously the Craft Masonic uh, Lodge uh, entered apprentice, fellow craft and master mason, or what most people think of as Freemasonry. Uh, he makes the claim that, that, that uh, the Crafts Lodge is related to the archetype of the craftsman. Uh, the York Rite, which has the Royal Arch degree and the quote-unquote Knights Templar degree, is related to the uh, warrior archetype and the Scottish Rite, uh, where you find the Rose Qua degree, which uh, most people would relate to, say, Rosicrucianism, uh, it relates to the uh, magician archetype. And he does say uh, that the Shriners also embody the, um, the Jester archetype. Um, uh, I, I would take issue with that on a couple of, uh, for a couple of reasons, uh, one of them being uh, the shrine actually originally uh, was intended uh, to be a kind of a serious um, translation of um, Sufism, uh, although it has become associated with good times and frivolity and charity today. So I don't think that's entirely accurate, and also it's kind of unnecessary um, because you have these three foundational um archetypes in those rites, which are the, the really the main rites of Freemasonry. And of course, there are uh, Scottish Rite craft lodges and there are York Rite craft lodges as well. So uh, those three go together, whereas the, the, the shrine, like many other side orders and appendix uh, bodies uh, and so on, are, are kind of on the side. So there's no reason to include the shrine. But between um, ancient Indo-European society uh, you know, 5,000 years ago or more, and uh, Freemasonry in the uh, modern era, uh, you find these archetypes turning up again and again. So during the 12th century, Sufism was transformed from a largely um, sort of wandering a Sufi master uh, type of structure, if you, if you can even say structure, to one where Sufi um, groups uh, ad adopted the uh, structure of craft uh, guilds, uh, lodges. Uh, so you have this, the Sufi master, apprentices, and so on. Uh, they infused it with Sufi mysticism, which would be the uh, magician, of course. And uh, they also, at the same time, infused it with um, a fotawa or Islamic chivalry, which would be the warrior. So in Sufism, again, you have this uh, craftsman, warrior, uh, magician, uh, these three archetypes coming together, and you only find them <clears throat> find them elsewhere as well. And you know, for example, in Plato, uh, Plato talks about education uh, needing to be through uh, music, craftsman, wrestling, the warrior, and philosophy, uh, the magician. So these archetypes uh, group together across history and even in prehistory. And uh, to me, it's kind of um, remarkable that yet again they turn up today, arguably in Freemasonry. 
And, um, you know, I would say uh, one should take this idea of the, you know, such a neat division of um, you know, Freemasonry and the York right being the warrior and the Scottish right being the magician with a little bit of a pinch of salt because you can find the, the three archetypes together in, in each of these rites and uh, within the Crafts Lodge as well. So, the, you know, the Crafts Lodge has Tyler with the sword. Sword is obviously related to the warrior. And then, of course, you have the notion of a personal kind of transcendence or um, uh, of self-overcoming, going towards death and towards divinity, which would be the magician as well. So you have these three archetypes within the craft lodge itself. But uh, so that's really why I wanted to explore these three archetypes, because they do underpin everything, um, I would say, within uh, spirituality in different ways. Uh, if you look further afield, of course, alchemy is a craft that has absorbed uh, um, uh, spirituality as well, much like Freemasonry. So that's something I explore. Um, you have the notion of div the divine builder, demiurge, the craftsman, or the, Plato spoke about the craftsman creating, um, uh, creating existence out of geometric building blocks and so on. Um, and so again, you would have this craftsman archetype in mysticism. Certainly, I think as, as most people would be aware, you have uh, um, the warrior intertwined with spirituality and mysticism, whether it's Shaolin uh, Buddhist monks or uh, uh, Islamic Futawa or the, the modern Russian martial art of Sistema, which draws on Russian Orthodox Christianity and so on. And so, yeah, so I really wanted to explore that uh, that basis, that foundation of uh, spirituality uh, from the, through these three archetypes. Uh, for myself, uh, you know, I, I would say that um, I was confident doing it and I was uh, interested in doing it because uh, I myself have experienced these three different archetypes in different ways. Uh, initiation in Freemasonry, yes, but also, um, you know, studying uh, fine art, uh, particularly with a very traditional um, uh, fine art uh, teacher in, in England, uh, studying Nam Pai Chuan, Shaolin Kung Fu, and then later on different styles of Kung Fu, uh, which has real real fighting in it. And I've been injured several times, so it's not just make believe, as uh, some martial arts can be. Uh, practicing um, uh, chakra type meditations or Kundalini type meditations, uh, being involved in uh, Western esotericism and um, different forms of uh, uh, quote-unquote Western esotericism since I was about the age of uh, 17 in a serious way and before that in a less serious way. So, you know, I've experienced all of these things firsthand. So I felt I would have a, a pretty good uh, grasp on it, on interpreting these different archetypes as well. Yeah, for sure. Um, before we get into speaking about them uh, specifically, I mean, I notice in my own life and in other people that, you know, we all have our strengths and weaknesses and preferences. And I find it somewhat rare that an individual like yourself would embody all three of these, you know, perhaps at different times, different moments, yeah. but like having gone through serious training study practice of each of these and it i recognize now how important that is to yeah. have a holistic human um but many times i feel that i've encountered um i don't want to say spiritual paths but sort of focuses in, in certain areas and, and it it's rare i think that the emphasis on development in all areas is so uh emphasized like i feel off like in my particular case like the magician philosopher what have you like that was always where i was yeah. i was like that's it and right over the past couple of years, I've been working on that, but um, can you talk about the nature of the importance of these working together in conjunction? Yeah, 
Sure. And you may have to uh, prod me a little bit, but I think the first thing to say is that, uh, you know, when we look at people who are just uh, involved in one of these, especially you, if they're very involved in it, uh, their short, shortcomings are often very evident. And so you, uh, I don't think um, it's unusual to come across, say, a spiritual master who, you know, can't walk t- 10 paces without wheezing and is, you know, eating a terribly unhealthy diet. And uh, it's not just that his body is unhealthy. I mean, that unhealthy body is then going to reflect on his mind as well. I mean, how can you have a, a clear mind if you can't, you know, walk for 30 seconds without needing to take a breath, you know? And I'm not being mean to those people. Uh, I would encourage them to, you know, eat a healthy diet and get fit. But there's this idea, particularly in spirituality, that ugh, the body, that's just disgusting. And uh, we can we can just ignore that and um, just develop our spiritual being. And typically, or very often, what happens when you have a, a guru saying that, oh, the body dirty, we've moved past that, I'm enlightened. Uh, they're usually, you know, making passes at the more attractive uh, female disciples, you know, for the female disciples own good, allegedly, so that they can reach nirvana quicker. But, uh, yeah, but those female disciples always have a good body, of course. They do, that's right. Yeah, it's yeah. never the unattractive ones. Yeah. So, so he yeah. hasn't moved past the body in that sense. <laughs> no, no, he hasn't moved past it at all because he hasn't even got down with the basics. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, if he disciplined himself, then maybe you could move past it, but he hasn't even attempted. And, um, you know, and of course, uh, maybe with the, the, the craftsperson, you know, what would that be today? The, the, the fine artist or the musician or something, uh, it, the, the super dedicated fine artist or musician, very creative and I fully endorse that. And, and each archetype or cast or profession has good things about it for sure, uh, which we need or we wouldn't want to develop all three. But uh, the danger there is you become this kind of weird eccentric person who can't really fit into society properly or the warrior again if you only develop the warrior side you might be very aggressive and intentionally stupid that you don't want to read books you know well we don't want to read a book (laughs) and (laughs) these are all massive failings of course and so you know the idea is that you you develop um, you know some kind of creative uh, skill or some kind of it can be self-expression that's good or trying to express the the infinite or the sacred or whatever it may be um uh, and just having mastery over your own life and your own, being creative in your life and then having some kind of uh, physical discipline where you're at least healthy um preferably you can defend yourself if there are you know if you're in a, ever in a violent situation um which is real and um but you know the the physical discipline is is itself important and uh you know if you go to a very strict and very disciplined uh, martial arts school you're you're going to have moments of real self-transcendence that you probably won't elsewhere uh particularly if you are someone you know, like me and you who are drawn to the spiritual that may not be inclined to violent behavior that when you are put in a, a position that really challenges you in a way that you're most uncomfortable with it's going to you'll have at least as many self-transcendent moments there as you will in any kind of meditation if if not more and then again of course we want to develop a calm mind calm being um, a sense of presence a sense of uh, well-being um, a stable mind uh, and and more uh, through developing a uh, spiritual routine and of course uh, w- along with that, um, uh, being conscious of the of the sacred, we can say as well. Yeah, thank you. That's well expressed. So, if we talk about the craftsman, yeah. To me, it really resonated when you write about uh, alchemists and um, this notion of. Uh, Becoming one who can not only make things in the world that are useful, Mm. but through the process of learning how to make things and then mastering that, like 
learning endless things about oneself and how to how to work how to learn like yeah. these are lessons that are completely invaluable right absolutely invaluable and uh, unfortunately today we may not have the opportunity or at least many people may not because maybe they're in a job where there is no real creativity or creating anything but uh, i think more problematic really is that um people often maybe uh, are not uh, willing to be uh, or at least we're not willing to commit themselves to a long period of learning how to create something and uh, i've said it before um, but uh you know, I used to uh, go to cafes and read a lot, both in England and, and in New York, where I live now. And, um, you know, this is 20 years ago. And uh, the, in many cafes I would go to, there would always be some terrible amateur fine art on the walls, you know. And, and usually the, the, the artists would do the same thing. They would have some kind of visual signature. So maybe it was like a little squiggle of some shape and they would put it in every single painting. Uh, so that they had their quote unquote own style and um, which they could then market. Uh, but and, you know, and I always felt, well, you know, wow, you know, it, it takes guts to, to take your paintings around and exhibit them in public. And that's to be admired. But the problem with the, the art on display inevitably was uh, uh, that it was just extremely amateur and they had never put the time into learning. Uh, how to do it properly. And, you know, I studied under, uh, I'm not going to mention his name, but uh, I studied under a very famous, a guy who is now very famous and exhibits in major museums in Great Britain and all over Europe. And um, he uh, was actually uh, uh, educated as a fine artist in the Eastern Bloc uh, when it was still communist. But uh, the communist Eastern Bloc actually preserved a lot of Western tradition that uh, Western Europe and America got rid of, uh, art, the art tradition being one of them. So you, if you were learning in the Soviet uh, Bloc uh, during the 1970s or 80s, uh, or early 80s maybe, uh, you had basically the same education as a fine art student did 500 years previous. And uh, he was absolutely ruthless and uh, would insist uh, that we just drew endlessly over and over again. And uh, just as an example, I remember one day he was making us draw a uh, life model and he would walk around the class uh, circling us and would just come over and erase what we had done all of the time throughout the day. And he must have er erased my drawing about 40 different times that day. We only worked on one drawing. And, um, and literally by the end of the day, everybody was so upset. There was only, I think, three of us left, maybe two of us. And um, we only had 30 minutes left. I, I finished my drawing yet again. And, uh, and he came over and I said, I think it's good now. And he said, yes, but do it again anyway. And he raised the whole thing and made me do it again. It's now one of my favorite drawings. But, uh, you know, uh, the, t today, I think if you did that, uh, most of the students well, most of the students left then, they would certainly leave now. I, I think some of them would cry. Uh, some of them would make complaints to the dean. Uh, many of them would drop out. And uh, it's just not possible. Uh, but that's actually the kind of education you need. You need somebody who says, you know, you're just a student right now. You don't have to be precious. We're going to keep doing it until you've mastered it. And then you can express yourself because you'll know what you're doing. And, uh, and that's a really tough lesson for Westerners to learn, unfortunately. And what we like is finding, uh, we like finding outlets or spiritual traditions that reinforce our own bad habits. So we used to, you know, 15 years ago, we liked Zen Buddhism because Zen Buddhism said, hey, man, you know, don't worry about the rules, just break them. And that's true. But that's because Zen Buddhism was, uh, you know, uh, founded in an environment where, where there were rules for every single little thing. You couldn't break them, you, you know, and it, it was uh, to tell people in medieval Japan, just break the rules uh, after they had been learning them for 25 years was, uh, was a, a total shock to the system. 
But it was also the right thing to tell them because they had been practicing for so long. They needed to transcend the practice and uh, transcend the rules and, you know, express uh, the Tao or the Do uh, uh, through their own uh, way, as it were. And, um, you know, that 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 is where you get master swordsmen like Miyamoto Musashi or master artists, people who have absorbed uh practice and absorb the rules to the point where they embody them and then at a certain point they can let go of the rules um but you don't want to break them before you've even learned the rules because then you've just produced rubbish yeah that's that's reminds me a lot what you were talking about with the zen tradition i mean yeah the like like that saying, like if you meet the Buddha on the road, kill him. Like, yeah, that wasn't meant to be some hip, like <laughs> self empowering, like saying no. that was meant to like shock the students so much that they went into a silence of like, what the fuck are you talking about? Why would I kill the Buddha? Are you crazy? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And then like digest that mm-hmm. and allow it to transform them. And yeah. And in this, at the same time, like the Zen teacher didn't coddle the students. They, they hit them with sticks. Yeah. <laughs> they beat them ruthlessly. Yeah. yeah. So I, like, and this, this is a hard thing, I think, for people to come to grips with in our society that number one, if you really want to be proficient at something you have to practice it for thousands and thousands of hours yeah that's you right. can never really be satisfied with what you've produced and you have to do it in a certain amount of time you can't just like decide like oh i'm gonna make it perfect and spend weeks or months on something like that. You can't do that. You have to be able to produce excellent work in a timely manner. Yeah. And to get someone to the point where they're capable of doing that often requires a teacher who is willing to become the object of hatred, derision, fear, whatever, to get the student to the next step. Yeah. Well, and, and and the funny thing is, not to get up, caught up on this, but, you know, when you have a teacher who is really, really strict with, with you and, and makes you just endlessly drill the same thing, you actually end up quite liking them. And then when they say something like, okay, that wasn't too bad, you kind of remember it for the next 20 years. You're like, wow, he said it wasn't too bad. Whereas, you know, normally people lavish praise on you and you forget it because you think, yeah, they don't even really mean it. Who cares? They say this to everyone. But you know that that, not total de- condemnation means that yeah that was actually really good <laughs> it's very true yeah um now the the warrior I, I feel like in our culture is i don't know our culture goes to extremes all the time and yeah for sure like it's possible to be capable of defending oneself and one's family and yeah possessions and whatnot without becoming some sort of you know stereotype that people think of like yeah. you know the gun toting confederate yeah. flag waving yeah you know person that and, and there are those people i mean stereotypes exist for reasons there are yeah. certainly those people but it doesn't mean that one has to become that in order to embody the warrior spirit either. I mean, one can embody a warrior spirit in almost any situation, right? Yeah, of course. Yeah. And I think um, the other thing to realize is, you know, we look at, you know, the, the redneck with a, with a gun and a very low IQ saying stupid, offensive things. And we say, Oh man, we don't want to be like that, you know. We don't, I don't want to be someone who's like that. So I'm not going to learn fighting or self defense or anything. Or how to use but, a gun. Or yeah. How to use a gun. Ooh, it's just, it's just horrible. But, you know, when you look at people who are completely incapable of defending themselves, they're often the most violent people you could ever meet. But yes, 
mentally, sure, okay, physically they'll never confront you because they're terrified, but mentally they'll do everything they can to destroy you. And, uh, and, and the effect they can have on your life is actually much, uh, probably much worse than the average, you know, um, bully on the street, really, uh, because they'll just try and destroy your livelihood, your reputation, uh, hiding behind, you know, a fake name somewhere or hiding behind 10 other people. And, uh, and they're incredibly violent people. Uh, just they, they do it in the name of love and lightness and all this kind of thing. Or at the very, the very, least, the very least, you know, be gossiping in, in your circle, trying to, you know, uh, oust you from the circle because, you know, you upset them because they are, they're just too sensitive about something, uh, even though you had no intention of it. And so, you know, the idea that the, the warrior is the most violent, uh, one of the problems with being so out of balance and only focusing on, let's say, one archetype today is that uh, the the passive and smiling and very friendly and very op open minded people, quote unquote, are actually, you know, very intellectually and mentally violent. And they're always condemning someone or some group of people, but they just think to themselves, oh, well, it's okay that I condemn this entire group, rednecks or whatever, or people who live in the South or whatever. I can condemn all of them because, you know, they're poor and they're not quite like us. And, uh, you know, it's incredibly discriminatory, actually, incredibly violent. And, yeah. and when, you, when you embody the warrior, when you work out physically and you learn self-defense, well, then you can have more respect for people that you don't like, um, that maybe are a little tougher than you, because then you can recognize that, you know what, those people might not be very intellectual, but they really embody a lot of hard work. They're able to visualize their, their stamina is incredible. They're able to push themselves through pain that I couldn't endure. So then you can have respect for them and they probably will respect you in return as well. And so, you know, the embodying the warrior doesn't make you violent. Often it makes you less violent. And uh, what I see today is an incredibly violent society. Yes, it's only emotionally and mentally and intellectually violent, but, uh, you know, the end result of that is, uh, uh, you know, a lot of suffering unnecessarily and a lot of con self-congratulations as well, of course. But uh, yeah, so one of the reasons to embody the warrior is to not be intellectually or mentally violent. Uh, yeah. so you can put it, you can channel that into your physical uh, routine and uh, into more productive areas. Well, you know, even if you are sparring against someone, at least, you know, you're not going to try and kill them, obviously. You're trying to help them. So you can put all of that emotion into those experiences and actually do some good for somebody you like or respect. So. Yeah, that's true. And I just, as an aside, I mean, I live in a very rural area with people who like firearms, who hunt, who farm, who do all of these things. Uh, you know, they drive big trucks in the mud and, you know, it's all of that stuff. But they're, they're perfectly kind and right, generous yeah. and intelligent and yeah. well-spoken, you know, they have different interests than a lot of people that live in urban areas for sure. But I think it, in their, our culture, particularly, we focus so much on our differences yeah, and they're, sure. they're really quite superficial differences when you really scratch the surface. That's right. Yeah. I mean, when you get to know people that are different to you and you think you won't like, there's usually something you can find in common or, at least be civil with each other. Um, sure. Yeah, and that's right. And, and yes, Western society entirely focuses on our quote-unquote differences uh, or makes them up uh, so that we can uh, attack each other. And, uh, you know, obviously a, a large part of this is to do with um, keeping people engaged. If people think that they're fighting a war on, on the net, they're going to keep clicking back, cl keep clicking back on those uh, newspaper outlets that are, that are dying otherwise and wouldn't survive without stirring up uh, hatred and uh, or social media. And um, so, yeah, a lot of it is that's the way to get people engaged and keep clicking back for sure. And then obviously 
um, it's it's good for political uh, parties as well because you can rally your base and shore up the base as it were. So, do you see any application for the warrior in terms of confronting one's own shadow or obscurations and yeah, you know, all of those those sides or aspects of ourselves that yeah we know we need to change. But yeah. often we don't even want to confront them. Right. Well, that that is, in a way, that's a, a large part of the warrior symbolism, right? So, you know, you have this idea in Christianity of the war in heaven, the casting out of um, of, of, of uh, Lucifer and by uh, the, the angel Michael or Michael and, uh, or Satan. And, um, uh, and, you know, you can see that as a mythical event outside of us, but also as a, an event inside of us that's taking place on maybe a daily basis. And, you know, even clearer than that, you, in, in Islam, of course, you have this notion of the, the greater and the lesser jihad, the greater and lesser struggle, the lesser struggle being the, the, the war on the battlefield and the greater struggle or greater jihad being the struggle with oneself to become a better person or a better Muslim. Uh, and so, yeah, confronting our dark side is absolutely uh, part of the, the warrior ethos. And, um, you know, unfortunately today, we individually, we don't think we have a dark side. And that, that's what enables us to attack everybody else because we say, oh, we're not like that. Uh, well, I'm a good person and those people are bad people as if, you know, as if people are so black and white. Well, actually, we're a whole bunch of... Uh, motivations and conflicting motivations and fears and hopes and memories and things we've forgotten that are still motivating us but we don't realize it and um you know we're complex human beings but we all have a dark side that's for sure and uh yeah and of course uh, i think uh, there are different ways in which the warrior confronts uh the, this dark side but certainly what one way is uh by contemplating our own mortality and our own death and um, contemplating your immortality, I think it makes you think more about uh, what's actually really important. And uh, it's not all this uh, superficial stuff. It's not getting involved in, in fights, uh, thinking we're right all the time because somebody told us something or we read something somewhere uh, that happened to fit our agenda. And uh, confronting, confronting our own mortality if you take it seriously and you're a spiritual person means, well, you know, where, where am I going after this and what, how am I going to prepare for that event? Because in many respects, spirituality isn't just about making sure we have a, an okay life uh, today and in, in, in our, in our life uh, as we live it. But it also means a preparation for death and what, what, what are, where are we going to be and what are we going to become after our death? Well, you, whether you believe in reincarnation or, uh, as in, let's say, Bud Buddhism, or you believe you're uh, going to uh, uh, go to some transcendent uh, realm such as heaven or whatever it may be in another religion. Um, you know, the part of the, the point of spirituality is to prepare for that that death and that transformation and uh, obviously that's uh, you're going to be in accord with certain ideas about the good or about god or deity and um you know being whether it's being a better person or you know having a calmer disposition or trying to do good in the world but certainly i think part of it is also recognizing one's own uh one's own dark side, meaning one's own um, unwholesome motivations and, uh, and, and recognizing uh, in a sense that the, the wiser we become, the, uh, in a sense, can recognize that we're not probably wise enough to be able to uh, tell the world how it should be running its own business. And certainly whenever this has been tried, it's been a disaster because the world is more complex than our ideas about it and contradictory and doesn't conform to our ideas and our ideology. So in a sense, it's also recognizing our own limits and our own need to work on our 
self and not on everybody else. Um, there's another aspect to the warrior that I've been thinking about recently, which is present in the stories about the quest for the Holy Grail. Right. And in those stories, you have the wounded Fisher King Mm -hmm. in his castle and the kingdom is suffering and the people are suffering. And there's uh, a need for somebody to do something to fix the situation. And as it turns out, what's required of Percival is to go to the castle and then ask the question, you know, whom does the grail serve? And that heals the king and heals the land and the kingdom. And it's, it's as if, at least in these stories, the warrior is meant to recognize and understand the need for a restoration of the essentially the divine feminine that will restore life, vitality, and 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 I think that is kind of what we're we're trying to say here in a, in a, in a way where we're we're to use that sort of forceful, resolute, disciplined action to confront that which needs to be confronted in order that life, love, right. vitality, and a softer way of being can emerge. Yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, mythologically speaking, you know, the warrior appears when things have gone awry. So, you know, there's this notion of the different ages in in, uh, in Hinduism and in, Gr- in Greek mythology and other mythologies as well. So you have the, the golden age or the Sattva Yuga and then various uh, ages that come after that and uh, each one being worse than the other. So the golden age or the silver age, uh, bronze age, copper age and so on. And the uh, same with uh, in, 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 in ancient Greek thought. And then in Hinduism, you have the yuga as the, uh, the Sattva yuga being the, the golden age, when everything is in harmony with God, let's say, or in harmony with the spiritual or the sacred, and man is in harmony with nature and vice versa. And, um, and there's no sickness and there's no corruption, or at least very little sickness and corruption let's say and then it gets more and more until you get to the the current age the kali yuga in which there is more and more corruption and sickness and degeneration and uh, this this is the worst of ages uh, the iron age according to greek thought which has nothing to do with historical ages as the, the the metaphor of these metals mm-hmm. which is almost an alchemical metaphor if you think about it um yeah, and and so in the golden age or the Sattva Yuga, you don't have warriors because there's no need for warriors. There's no need for war because there's no corruption. And it's only really as you get further uh, through these ages, you know, through to the uh, the Iron Age or the Kali Yuga, that the the warrior begins to appear because the, the heaven has gone out of balance, to use a, a rather Taoist term, and. Um, and, and heaven needs to be restored. And so you do have in you know ancient China this idea of the, of the mandate of heaven, and uh, where where a, a warlord is able to rise up and uh, conquer neighboring territories that that, are, that have abandoned uh, the way of uh, the way of things, the way that things should be done, uh, so that they are in accord with heaven. And uh, and then he would say that well, I rose up against them and. Uh, took took them over because uh, I had to restore the mandate of heaven. So yeah, so this is the idea of the the, uh, the warrior as a kind of spiritual uh, force in a sense. It's an it's an ugly thing that you're engaged in actual physical battles and killing people. But the, the idea is that that heaven has gone so out of balance, or heaven and earth have gone so out of balance that. The only way to restore it is through some kind of uh, bloodshed. And obviously this is, uh, uh, without saying anything too controversial, but this is the idea of 
uh, jihad, at least if you listen to many uh, contemporary Islamic scholars, that, that, uh, that you know, it's supposed to be a, a defensive war with all kinds of uh, rules and restrictions around it. And, um, you know, I'm sure they've not always been obeyed, but that that is the, the, the principle that, you know, that you are, that you're under attack, so you have to restore, in a sense, the, the will of Allah, or as the ancient Chinese would say, the mandate of heaven. So, uh, and of course, you find this in the West as well, the idea of the, the crusaders with swords that, you know, have uh, the shape rather like a cross and there's a, you know, the warrior monk and this kind of thing. It's because uh, they're doing the will of will of God, as it were. And obviously we all know, and it's uh, kind of boring to hear yet again some kind of condemnation of this, you know, that, that there were excesses or they did terrible things. Of course they did terrible things because they were warriors and you can find that in any culture. And uh, But the point, the mythological point is that the the world has gone so out of balance that it needs some extreme measure to bring back the sacred because it's become too material. It's gone too far into the into the Iron Age or the Kali Yuga, and that's the only way to pull it back, as it were. Yeah, it's something for us to think about for sure. Yeah, yeah, and uh, you know, not to not to. Um, uh, belabor a point, but you know, you could have think about that as a spiritual metaphor for ourselves. That you know, we can become too indulgent in things. That maybe we just want to sit around and you know, I'm as prone to this as anyone. Sit around and eating unhealthy food and snacking and and uh, not working out, and then you what happens? You become unhealthy. So then you need to you need to become healthy and fit very quickly. So then now you have to have a much more extreme regime to get healthy and fit again than you would if you've just eaten healthy all along and had a little exercise throughout the last few years, let's say. It needs something much more violent to bring you back to health. That's true. Or even think about surgery. That's an act of violence that is bringing you back to health. Yeah. There's no uh, easy solutions. Not at a certain point. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the easy solution is to be disciplined every day. Yeah, right. Which is, uh, you know, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and there, of course, depending on which archetype you're talking about, they're all, in a sense, very disciplined. If you want to be a master craftsman, you have to be disciplined, or a master warrior, you have to be disciplined. Or if you want to be a master magician, whether that's a priest or a philosopher, let's say, you still have to be very disciplined. And, uh, and of course, many, uh, as I say, many, uh, many. People were all three of those uh, throughout time, or at least two, you know, certainly. Yes. A warrior and a poet was very common, or a warrior and a philosopher was very po uh, was very common. So, yeah, you had to be very disciplined, very self-disciplined. Oh, yeah. In the second half of the interview, in the Chamber of Reflection, Angel and I continue to discuss the three stages of initiatic spirituality, focusing more on the archetype of the magician, as well as gnosis and some of the results of intense spiritual practice including bliss states and gnostic intoxication and how they are used as a method to better know the actual nature of reality join us for that fascinating conversation and i'd like to remind you that although you're able to listen to this podcast at no charge it costs time and money to create we ask you to support our efforts in the creation of future podcasts by joining the membership section at chamberofreflection.com or subscribing via Patreon at patreon.com slash occult of personality. And if you're already supporting the show or have done so in the past, my heartfelt thanks and I salute you.